in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much for this time to gather together in your name. Thank you for the blessing of being part of the family of God through Jesus Christ. One seed is the first time. Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, let us be peacemakers, even as Jesus Christ is the greatest peacemaker, the Son of God. Lord, help us to walk uh, not in pride, but in humility, not in anger, but in peace. Help us to follow, uh, not the example of Herod that we'll see today, but rather the example of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. And help us to shine your light in our community, today and always. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. It's good to be back with you today. Good to see you. If you want to stand as we sing, you feel free to stand. You feel the stand, you feel free to sit. Go
right, we will turn to Acts chapter 12, and we'll continue looking through the book of Acts today. We see the ongoing story of the church and the explosive growth of it, the story that we continue to be a part of. We'll look at Acts chapter 12, starting at verse 20, and go through verse 24. So just a few verses today. But this is the conclusion of the story that we were looking at earlier, looking at last week, with Peter being taken out of the prison, the angel coming and striking him and telling him to stand up, and then Herod losing his prisoner, who was upset about this, and sends the guards away to their death, presumably. And then he goes on to Caesarea, and we see the continuation of the story, a reappearance of another angel who also strikes Herod, uh, and he is becomes eaten up by worms, as the scripture puts it, we became worm eaten. So we'll take a look here. If you will stand as we read the text of scripture together. Now he was very angry, this is verse 20, with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And with one accord they came to him, and having won over Blastus the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, the voice of a god and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the examples, both good and bad, that we see in Scripture. We ask you, Lord, that you would help us not to follow this way of error, this way of anger and of pride, which leads to an ignominious and a vile death. But, Lord, we ask that you would help us instead to follow the example of the apostles, the example of Peter, ultimately the example of Jesus Christ, who was perfect in humility and perfect in peace. Amen. You may be seated. So we continue to see the story develop, and we're, we're leading up here to Herod. And a few notes on Herod. He was not a very good person. None of the Herods seemed to be very good. They were just a nasty family. Where this was Herod Agrippa, who was the grandson of Herod the Great, who famously tried to kill all the children in Bethlehem, if only he could get rid of Jesus, of the new king of the Jews. We see that this Herod also had attained greatness, that he controlled the territory of, ultimately, Herod the Great. Uh, he came to control the territory of Herod Antipas, who was the son of Herod. He controlled the territory of Philip the Tetrarch. He was proclaimed to be king. The Romans gave this new Herod the title of king, and this irritated Herod Antipas, uh, who was older than him. He went to Rome and complained about it. And that's when the Roman emperor said, okay, your territory now belongs to Agrippa. And he next hops into France. So this was another Herod who had achieved greatness. Uh, he controlled all this same territory, this massive territory throughout Israel. And so he apparently thought of himself as someone very great. We can see that he was a very angry person. And you can almost see the hereditary nature of this anger has been passed down. That his grandfather was a wicked and a violent and an angry person, Herod the Great, where the emperor quipped about him, I would rather be Herod's pig than his son. Because he knew at least a pig would be safe in the Jewish household. His son would not. And so he was very angry, and it seems to have passed on, you know, like father, like son, this example that he was given. Now, at the beginning of the text, it says he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And this is something I'd like to draw attention to, is the nature of this anger. Why were the people of Tyre and Sidon coming to him? Well, it wasn't because they respected Herod. It wasn't because they loved Herod that they wanted to have peace with him. It was only because he was angry. And we know that when someone is angry, that you tend to desire to bring about hurt or even death. To the other person. That hatred is like the end of anger. That Augustine could say, well, hatred consists in holding on to anger for a long time. Now, I don't think that this is the only thing that hatred 
but holding on to long anger, choosing to continue in anger. This is kind of the essence of hatred, because anger leads you to want ill for someone else. This is something that we can see on a very serious note happening in Israel right now, that uh, these, this group called Hamas, a terrorist group, has anger and hatred toward Israel uh, in such a way that they even would celebrate over innocent civilians being killed. And they're doing this even right now. This is what anger and hatred lead you to. This is the perfection of anger and hatred. It ends even in murder, such that Jesus could say, if you hate your brother, you have murdered him in your heart. And so you are guilty of murder. This is the end of anger. This is an example that we don't want to follow. Says, do not be hasty in your spirit to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. It says, the scripture in the book of James says that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You see, instead, it produces wickedness, produces death and destruction. This is why the people of Tyre and Sidon, they do. Herod, Agrippa, this great Herod, is angry with us. And so they know, well, he might take away our food in order to afflict us, to cause us to suffer. There was a certain philosopher named Brokheis, I read in one of my classes I did, that a good test of a philosophy, a good test of a worldview, is to take it all the way out to its conclusion and see what kind of person you would be if you really followed after this way. If you really follow after this way of Herod, this way of anger, this way of bitterness, then you will be a murderer. You will have hatred and bitterness in your heart. That's the final conclusion. That's, that's what happens. Whereas if you follow the way of peace, what is the ultimate example of peace? Well, that's Jesus Christ. If you choose to follow peace, and as Zechariah said, he will show us the way of peace. As Isaiah would say, he is the prince of peace. As Jesus would say, if you are peacemakers, you are sons of God. And there, I don't think there's any higher title you could possibly have. If you are a peacemaker, you will be called a son of God. And that's Jesus' part. That's very significant. So we can see anger is something we want to put aside. Especially this kind of evil, selfish anger that Herod shows. We can assume that Herod, this, again, this very nasty person, we already know just from this passage, he killed James. He was trying to kill Peter. Peter got away. He killed all the guards. It says he sent them away. And some translations will even say to their death, something like that, to execution, kind of adding what's implied. And then he's coming over here, and Tyre and Sidon, these whole towns are afraid he's going to take away our food because he's angry with us. And we see there's an example in Marvel Comics of the Incredible Hulk. It's kind of a fantasticalized version of anger. And you might remember from the TV show, and there's comic books, and there's movies. But when he gets very angry, he becomes big and strong, and then he starts smashing things. So that's something that you can be certain about the Incredible Hulk. It's that Hulk smash. And this is what anger does. It's actually a really accurate representation of anger. That when you give yourself over to this anger, and you choose this, then that will be your inclination to smash, to hurt. And it takes away your reason. It's been said that anger blinds the eye of reason. And so, Tyre and Sidon are coming and trying to bring him back down into peace as he's holding on to his anger. And we can talk a little bit about, well, what's the difference between anger, righteous anger, and unrighteous anger? Because we know that God is angry at sin every day. He has indignation at it. He's slow to anger. But he is angry at evil, and he despises this. I think perhaps the best example, or a very strong example, of a godly kind of anger would be when Jesus saw the people in the temple turning what should be a house of prayer into a den of thieves, and afflicting all the people who come and charging them way too much, and taking advantage of the fact that they wanted to worship God. 
He was angry at wickedness against God. This is the kind of anger that can be righteous. And yet even then, I, I think it would be wise to try to avoid anger. This, again, the scripture says, just in general, do not be hasty in your spirit to be angry for your bosom, to be angry. It resides in the bosom of fools. Anger doesn't tend to lead you toward righteousness. But if you are going to be angry, it shouldn't be at yourself. Oh, I have been slighted. You can be genuinely, righteously angry at something that is a sin against God. That's a genuine evil. Now, these are very different things. But in fact, God teaches us we ought to be people of peace. So this is the anger of Herod. And it's connected to pride. And you could say that pride is a source of all sins, almost. Uh, Herod was angry with them, presumably, because they had spited him or were doing something to him. And you can almost think of it like you're making yourself into God. If righteous anger is that you have sinned against God, this is despicable to you. Unrighteous or selfish anger, you have sinned against me, is despicable to you. Where Herod could say, or could accept the phrase, I am God, and then be stricken by an angel and die. This is the ultimate expression of pride, to make yourself into God, to be angry that you have been slighted. But how dare you do something against me? This is the ultimate expression of pride, and we can see how it leads to anger. If you're twisted and turned and contorted onto yourself, and you think that you are God, then of course you'll be angry when someone sins against you. That's a horrible offense. How could you sin against me? And yet Jesus gives us the example when people sin against him, and he's the only one who could have been justified arguably, in being angry about this, saying, how could you sin against me? But Jesus, being in the form of a man, being a man, he wasn't angry then. He was reviled, and he did not revile in return. He was persecuted and afflicted and led away to crucifixion. He did not open his mouth. Like a sheep being led to the slaughter, he was silent. And in fact, he prays for the people who are persecuting him. And he sees women weeping, and he says, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. Weep for your children. Weep for what's going to happen to you. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We see the peace and the humility of Jesus contrasted with the pride and the arrogance of Herod. So this pride, this arrogance, it leads to anger. These are both things that we want to remove from our lives. That the church should not be known as an angry people, a selfish and a prideful people, Rather, we should be known as a humble people, as a people who are peaceful and who bring about peace. A few historical notes that we can add about Herod. But how do we know he was so prideful? Well, the scripture points out that he put on his royal apparel. And Josephus says, as a first century historian, that he was coming to Caesarea and there were games that were being put on. I believe it was to celebrate the emperor. And he comes and he comes into this theater, quite possibly, uh, there in Caesarea. Uh, I took this when I was over there. They still put on shows and things. You can see those chairs are not 2,000 years old, um, but the rest of it is. But he comes possibly into this exact theater. I think there might have been another one a little further down, probably was similar. And he's wearing this silver garment. Josephus says it was radiant. The sun was shining off of this silver garment. And we know if this is a theater, then we can suppose there might have been Greek plays that were put on there where a god might show up in the play. And maybe they would have been dressed up in a very fancy way. So this is something you might expect to see. You go to the theater, you see a depiction of a god, and then we see they start crying out, it's the voice of a god and not of a man. And Herod was silent. This is something else that we can learn from this passage, that silence can be consent. And sometimes people will go to you and present something to you, and if you say nothing, then they'll take that as, okay, you've accepted this. You haven't stopped it. We even see in Scripture that if a man's daughter makes a vow, and he learns of it and says nothing, then the vow will remain. On this teaching about vows in the Old Testament, where the father had the right to say, well, no, this is not a good vow that you've made. He was going to, to cancel it out. But if he says nothing when he saw her, then the vow remains. 
So saying nothing can be a form of consent. We don't want to be guilty of that. Herod didn't sin when the people were saying the voice of a god, not of a man. At that point, he was not guilty of any sin. He was guilty of lots of other sins. But he wasn't guilty of that. But when he said nothing, and he allowed it to go on, he didn't correct it, then he was guilty. So we don't want to fall into that same temptation. We see Jesus is a much better example. Herod was an example of pride, of a very foolish kind of pride. He was just a man, and yet he accepted praise like a god. He wasn't angry about offense at God. He was angry at offense at himself, most likely. And he followed the example of his father. Teach your children to be peaceful. We see it passing down. Grandfather, son, grandson. You need to teach your children to be people of peace. But we see that Jesus gives us that example of peace and humility. It's kind of opposite things to the anger and pride. The Bible says that Jesus humbled himself. He said he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, as Herod apparently did. But rather, humbling himself and finding himself in the form of a man, he humbled himself in obedience all the way to death on a cross. So that for this reason, God has given him the name above every name. So that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. See, the pattern that Jesus gives you is through humility to exaltation with God. And that's not a selfish and a foolish kind of exaltation. That's God himself giving you that eternal life and that glory together with him. The Herod's problem was he wanted to take divine glory for himself. But believers will be glorified, the scripture says. It's not because we are gods. It's because God is God. And he wants to give that to us. So the ironic thing is that if you are filled with pride and conceit and anger, then you will actually be crushed down. We see the end of this is to become worm eaten, as the scripture puts it. The very ugly end. And so the Bible can say that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But I think Isaiah says the back of the proud will be broken will break the uplifted arm. These types of ideas, they run throughout Scripture. That God is concerned with your heart. If it's filled with anger and bitterness and pride, which is causing these things, or if it's filled with humility and peace. So this is the challenge today. This is what I want to draw out from it and to present to you. Will you follow Jesus, the Christ, the Prince of Peace, the one who showed perfect humility, even all the way up to death on a cross? <clears throat> or will you follow Herod, this worm-eaten man who's filled with anger and pride? I think Jesus sets us a much better example. As the incredible Hulk would say, he was a very puny God, Herod was. He was not a God fit to be worshipped. He was a worm-eaten man. This is the end of nature. This is the end of murderousness. This is the end of pride. Is to become like Herod. We want to follow the Prince of Peace, the one who is humble, and to be like Jesus. So I would invite you to look into your own heart and to see, are you following Herod the Worming, or are you following Jesus the Christ? As we move to the time of invitation... Take a look and use this time to analyze and to look at your own heart and see, am I following anger? Am I a person filled with pride? Do you have a root of bitterness in your heart? The Apostle Paul doesn't want us to have a root of bitterness in our hearts. He wants us to root that out. We see the end of it. We see the worm-eating nature of these things. Or are you following a way of peace? Are you showing others to be peaceful? The example that Jesus gave is peace and humility which leads to eternal life. This is the example we want to follow. If you haven't accepted Jesus at all, then that's where you start. You have to turn from your pride in humility to accept the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. 
to turn away from sin and to believe on him, to follow him. So I would invite you to do that even today if you haven't. But if you are following Christ, see who you are really following. Is it Herod or is it Jesus? We'll move to a time of invitation. If you will stand. If you'd like, we can come and pray together about any of these things. You can pray right where you are.